Don't you love the Lord? Hallelujah. Don't the rest of you love the Lord? Yeah. Give honor to Brother and Sister Betcher and I'm very much thankful for them and uh, thankful for a little nourishment. <clears throat> and if you're wondering what's in that cup, it's coffee. I never asked for it. There's a lot of places I go, they just bring me a cup of coffee. And uh, I just figure they're very gifted people. A lot of discernment. <laughs> um, but I give honor to them, and, and I, I very much thank the Lord for them. Their friendship and their hunger for the things of the kingdom and the spirit. And they have gone above and beyond to help Malachi and I be welcomed. And there goes my little Malachi out in the foyer. He brought a suit with him on this trip. He was very determined he was going to want to wear that and do a little preaching with me. And then this morning he decided that since he didn't bring his notes with him, he'd just hold on. <laughs> I believe I'll do that next time, Dad. I said, well, do you want to wear your suit? No, I believe I'd rather wear what I wore last night. I said, well, since your mama's not here, we'll do that. <laughs> and since you're not going to tell her, it'll be all right. That's right. What happens in Bartlett stays in Bartlett. <laughs> Hallelujah. But I am very thankful for all of their kindness. And uh, Brother Robbie Betcher has spent time with him playing video games and swimming with him and become one of Malachi's heroes. And uh, this morning he informed me that he'd be most happy to wait for me, except that Robbie was probably waiting on him upstairs. And he needed to go see what Robbie was doing. Okay, son. Matter of fact, last night when we were leaving the joint, I got in the back seat with him and he looked at me and he said, I believe I'd rather Robbie ride back here with me. <laughs> Whatever. So... Thank you for becoming one of my son's heroes. <clears throat> and I do mean that. I don't want my children to hate the ministry. I don't want them to resent the ministry. And I am gone so much. Typically, my wife is a single mom about 240 days a year. She never gripes and she never complains about it. And she has done a phenomenal job raising our children without me there. And I honor her. I want to take you to the book of 2 Corinthians, if I could. <clears throat> Chapter number 10, verse number 4. I have to tell you, I've got an iPad right here in front of me, but I do miss, I, I've, I've gone back to carrying my Bibles with me, but I, I do miss hearing the sound of pages rustling in the building. And uh, I love Bibles. I, I've got an office full of them. And a friend of mine used to run a Bible bookstore, so when they'd come across something unique or out of print, they'd buy it, and he'd call me, and I'd go get it. And uh, I just like to open them up and just stick my face in them and smell the pages. I don't know why, but I just I love Bibles. Second Corinthians chapter number 10 uh, verse number four, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Look to your neighbor and tell them they're not carnal. That means fleshly. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Look to your neighbor and tell them, say, our weapons are mighty. All right, everybody on the left side say it now. Everybody say it. Our weapons are mighty through God. Now I'm going to read it again in your hearing in the Amplified Classic Edition. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, but they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. And then, as you might have anticipated, one more time in the Passion Translation. Uh, for although we live in a natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. 
Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. Isn't that powerful? Um, The dictionary defines stronghold as a place that has been fortified so as to protect it against attack. Uh, It is a place where a particular cause or belief is strongly defended or upheld. And all of those uh, strongly held beliefs are not necessarily good ones. Uh, I would like to believe that every stronghold in the life of a child of God was a powerful apostolic stronghold, and I do believe the church should be that. Uh, As a matter of fact, I think it is the will of God for the church to be an apostolic stronghold. And strongholds are not designed to just keep things out. They're also designed to keep things in. And sometimes, because of our susceptibility to influence, uh, we put up walls, that's what we call them, but we build strongholds. And the one thing that we're keeping in is us. And um, we're keeping wounds in We are keeping offenses protected. Do you realize uh, that we we go to great lengths sometimes to protect our own offenses? We don't want to talk about it. And we'll say, I don't want to talk about it. Well, really, that's code for, I think I'll just protect this. And um, so we don't want to talk about the way we've been offended. And sometimes we have such uh, memories about our past that we don't want to talk about those either and um, they're painful I get it Uh, it's unfortunate this event happened that happened somebody did this to me somebody did that to me or I did this and I did that regardless of how the event took place or who initiated it it's there and so inevitably rather than confront it and deal with it and get free of it we build a wall around it. The problem, however, is that wall does not just isolate that event in our memories. It attaches us to that event. The scripture uh, poses a question at one point. Now, I'm just going to chat a little while, and and angels will start moving around in a minute, and the Lord's going to help us, but just bear with me and the Lord. Um, The question is posed in scripture, what then shall separate us from the love of God? That's the question. Then the immediate response to the question is uh, neither height nor depth nor things present nor things to come. Um, and, and there's a few more things that are mentioned. But then the thing that is very obvious to me is what's not mentioned. What shall separate us from the love of God? That question really goes unanswered because the response to the question is Here's what won't separate us from the love of God. Okay, well, that's great, but there was something that wasn't mentioned, and I ask the question, what will separate us from the love of God? And the writer simply says, these are the things that won't separate us from the love of God. But the one thing that's left unmentioned and undiscussed is a particular element of time. He talks about time in the present tense, time in the future tense. Not things present, nor things to come. So nothing going on in my life now, nor anything going on from this point forward is going to be able to separate me from the love of God. But he did not mention the element of time that we consider the past. And the one thing that can separate us from the love of God is our past. Every human in this room has one. And I don't care how sanctified you think you came out of the womb, all of us came out of the womb, and all of us were born into sin and shapen by iniquity. So that being the case, every person in this room has something iniquitous in our past that we wish was not there. There's not a person in this room that doesn't have at least one regret. And if you've only got one, then God bless you. You need to come see me after church because I've got a boatload of things that I would like to get figured out. 
Uh, I've had the Holy Ghost since I was nine years old. Four more years, it'll be 50 years I've had the Holy Ghost. And I'm just telling you right this minute, before I was nine, I didn't really do a whole lot of junk that was regretful. But since I was nine, yeah. <laughs> I had a man preaching for me one time when I was pastoring. And he, he pointed at me on the platform. He said, if everybody in this room wants a ministry like me and your pastor have. And I'm thinking, oh, my God. He said, I'm going to tell you why we've got the anointing we've got. Because we never did this, and we never did that, and we never did this, and we never did that. And I'm thinking, you the dumbest box of rocks that's ever rolled up in behind this pulpit. Because I did every one of them things. <laughs> but I looked. There were a couple ladies who had been prostitutes before they came to know the Lord. And they sat on the second row, on the end of the second rows. We had bought a 65 passenger bus, got both of them a CDL license. Neither one of them had a car. And I gave them a church credit card for gas. I said, now, here's your transportation to and from church. The only request I have is two things. Put as many people on it as you can and get here 30 minutes early for prayer. Other than that, help yourself. When he began to talk about all the things that we had never done, they began to weep. Not rejoicing over us, but being locked up in the prison again. I looked at a girl sitting on the right-hand side over there who had a mom that was a high-end prostitute in Vegas, and her mother would disappear on private jets for weeks at a time with these high rollers from all over the world. And they would travel and gamble all over the world. And she may be gone two or three weeks. Well, this young lady had a little sister, and if child services ever found out or whoever ever found out that they were staying in this little cheap, ratty hotel uh, that was one of those monthly deals, uh, had a little kitchenette in it and whatever, if they ever found out they were there alone, they were going to come get her and the little girl and probably split them up, find homes for them. So she did the only thing she knew to do, which was turn tricks like her mother. And at 14 and 15 years old, that's how she paid the bills in Las Vegas for her and her sister to be able to stay together and have a home. I watched as she began to sob. I looked back, and there was a man that was one of the greatest soul winners I've ever known. He bowed his head, and tears just began to run out of his face. Again, not rejoicing at the sinless life he thought we had lived. But he was rejoicing. He was weeping because he had, prior to coming to know the Lord, been a drug dealer, a, a big-time one. And he went to meet a man one night to sell a bunch of drugs, and it was a setup. And the guy was actually not there to buy the drugs but to rob him and kill him and be done with it because he had a pile of them. And as this guy stepped out of the shadows to kill him, he reached in the panel of his door, car vehicle, the window was down. He reached in, pulled out his, and, and shot that man ten times and killed him. It was self-defense. Even though it was a drug deal going bad, it was still self-defense, and he didn't do prison time. But he will never live a day without the identity being attached to him that he had killed a man. And the regret and the remorse that because of the life he had chosen to live that put him in that position, he had to kill a man in order to stay alive himself. There were, there were stories like that all over that building. And as I listened to this man tell all these people about the great anointing in what he thought was our lives because we had never done these things, I watched as one person after the next was taken into captivity by the past. And it marched them right back down into the dungeon that God had dug each one of them out of. <clears throat> So we got to the office after church that night, and he said, what did you think about that tonight? I, I've never preached that before. I said, well, I pray to God you never preach it again. He said, really? What was wrong with it? I said, everything. I said, but here's, here's something you need to know. You have such little understanding about the blood that you really ought not even preach again until your revelation is expanded. He said, what do you mean? I said, all the stuff you think I didn't do. We were friends. We were close. We grew up together. If anybody should have had a clue, you should have. 
But you never knew. You thought that I never did any of those things you rattled off today. But I did almost every one of them. No, you didn't. I said, matter of fact, you did about a third of them. The sad thing was, though he was trying to pretend he wasn't, he also was still a prisoner of his past. And he was lying about it. Couldn't come clean with himself. He didn't have to confess it to the world, and you don't either. But in his own mind, he had to acknowledge, you know what, this is, this is a part of what I've been and done. It's not who I am now, but I've been there and I've done that. So on Sunday night after, you know, it's wonderful to just put ink on a check and send a brother on. So that's what we did. And because uh, I didn't know what else he might come up with. And I, I'd just come to the conclusion if he did something else like that, I was going to have to get up and knock him out right there on the platform. So rather than have to get violent, I just paid him and sent him on. And I didn't know how to fix all that he had done. Brother Williams, I didn't know. And the Lord said, well, transparency will go a long way. Okay. So I walked right down in front of that church and stood right in front of them. And I said, I want to clear some things up. Don't, don't want a ministry like mine. Want one that goes way beyond where mine's gone. Number two... Uh, don't let what you think disqualifies you bother you anymore because that brother had no clue but what I had done, some things he listed off. I'd done them. And those same people began to weep again, but this time it was relief. And you could just almost hear doors being unlocked and chains dropping off of people. Not because I preached a great word, but because the reality of it is the blood of Jesus is really... That power. Do you realize that when he talks about us taking off our unrighteousness and putting on his righteousness, you never have to identify it, not ever again. Not one more syllable ever has to come out of your mouth identifying with what you have done in your past. Ever. It's the past. It's what I did. It's not who I am. And the enemy's got us all conflicted in our brains because he's trying to convince us that what we have done is really who we are. Right. And it's not. When you have done it, but you've broken away from it, and you found an altar, and we repented, and we've been baptized. When, when, when you come up out of that water, I know it's just water. But when you come up out of this, this little baptistry back here, just out of a simple act of obedience... Every sin, every thought, every attitude, every bad word, every, every well, what, what do we, we don't get rebaptized every day, but you don't have to. G.T. Haywood wrote about a stream of blood. He said, I see a crimson stream of blood. And that water, that blood just flows continually in your life. And so when the book says, if you're faithful to Repent, I'm faithful to forgive. That blood just washes you all over again. It's just, it never stops. As long as you'll put it under the blood, the blood will cover it up. And I'm going to tell you something. God's not a grave digger, and he don't tolerate people digging around in your junk. <laughs> That's right. And so the past... I'm not telling you to run out and be proud of every wrong thing we've ever done. But the shame that we have over the past is what imprisons us. Well, I'm ashamed of what I did. Well, forgive yourself. Now, I've, I've heard people that speak to the contrary about that, that you don't have to forgive yourself. If God has forgiven you, it's enough. But I got news for you. It's, it really isn't. There are some things... Um, that God cannot do, and that is convince us that he's really forgiven us. But then we've got to accept that fact. We've, it's in the book. He told us, if you'll repent, I'll forgive you. But the problem isn't always the fact that God forgives us. The problem is we can't forgive ourselves, Or we won't forgive ourselves because somewhere along the way, Christendom or something within and of itself has convinced us 
that the only way I am really repentant and re I've got to prove to somebody, I've got to prove to everybody in this room that I'm really repentant. Who's going to believe me that, you know, I just rolled in here on a Sunday morning, came to the altar, repented, and, and, and God washed me clean as snow, and now I'm, I'm good to go again? Nobody's going to believe that. It don't matter what anybody in this room believes. What matters is, did I repent? And if I repented, he forgave me. And if you've got a hang up with that or you've got a problem with that, God bless you, but that's between you and Jesus. As for me, I'm going to leave that junk at the altar and go ahead and do what God's called me to do. And if that's not okay, then we've got an additional problem because if somebody that has been away from God, somebody that cussed somebody out on your way here this morning, you said a bad word in traffic or had a bad attitude or whatever the case would be, if you come in that building and repent at any one given point in time, how long do you want God to wait before he forgives you? 30 days? 60 days? Do, do you really want to do penance and prove to God for the next 45 days that I'm really sorry? Or do you want him to forgive you at the moment you said I'm sorry? I want immediate forgiveness. I don't know about the rest of it. I'm not a glutton for punishment. I want immediate forgiveness. And if I repent and he forgives me and then the next five minutes the rapture takes place, I intend to go. If that's true, then I'm not going to live like I have not been forgiven one second once I've repented. Well, that's arrogance and pride. No, it isn't. That's an understanding and a revelation about his righteousness, his purity. When I have repented, it's over and done with. At that moment, it's done. The problem is, as powerful as the Holy Ghost is, it, it doesn't eradicate our memories. And so you can be in a restaurant and you can hear a song come on that was popular during a negative season of your life, and that song will trigger memories that take you down a lane that you thought was under the blood. And the enemy will lie to you and tell you, oh, yeah. If you've ever been a cigarette smoker and you sit around and somebody's outside a restaurant door and they fire one up and take that first drag off of it, there's something about that first puff that will light you up and you're thinking, man, that smells good. And then here comes the enemy. You wouldn't believe that if you were really delivered. My daddy smoked cigars when I was a little kid. God delivered him from it. But he, he quit smoking at a certain point in his life. But when I was a child, those cigars, I could smell them Swiss or sweets. And, it, and, and even right now, if, if my daddy's been dead for several years, but if I smell a Swiss or sweet fired up, I know exactly what it is when I smell it. And it makes me think of those years when I was a little kid. And the enemy will tell me from time to time, you want to smoke just like you want to be a, you want to be a cigar smoker. Well, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. Of course I don't want to smoke one. But the enemy's looking for any way he can to re-imprison us back into stuff that God has forgiven of and put under the blood and whatever. If there's no stronghold there, there's nothing to be imprisoned by. If we've torn it down and if we've let God eradicate it, then there's nothing for the enemy. But if he triggers those thoughts in us enough, we'll rebuild what God tore down. And we'll be right back in that same prison. Whether we're drinking or smoking again or not, we'll be right there believing that we really want to. He remembereth our frame that it is but dust. If you had a proclivity to gossip before you received the Holy Ghost, guess what? You're still going to have a tendency to want to gossip the day after you receive the Holy Ghost and baptized in Jesus' name. I thought it made us a new creature. It does. But it doesn't disappear your flesh. It doesn't eradicate our personalities. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go on record and admit something to all of you. i got a short fuse when it comes to some things. And people that like to flip me off going down the highway, <laughs> mm. there's a period of time in my life I needed to be driving a slow driving hoopty so I couldn't catch them I followed a guy one night till I had two miles left in my tank I 
I feel my pressure going up right now. Y'all pray for a brother. Man, I, I got to take this off. I about broke out in the heat. I, I don't know what it is about that, but there's an arrogance attached to it. You're going to fly by me and do some kind of signal. <laughs> no, no. Uh-uh, Jesus be a fence. That's all I can tell you. I remember one time in Texas, I was on the loop going around this city. And these two little boys that were no doubt in their mama's car. One of them's mama's car because it was a wood panel station wagon looking get up. Run up on the brother and I was minding my own business. And there they went saluting me. And a battle took over in my brain. Leave it alone. Leave it alone. The devil is alive. The devil is alive. I'm going after him. So I couldn't get them to pull over. I was about to smite them hip and thigh. You hear me. And they wouldn't pull over. The only thing left was either let them go, suffer the indignation of it all, or leave an impression. I went with an impression. I couldn't hit the windshield, the window on the passenger door, but I could reach that mirror. And I'm telling you, I don't know how fast we were going, but I beat the side view mirror plumb off <laughs> the door. That's not easy to do. <laughs> but when you're not walking with Jesus, a lot of things are doable. And at that moment, Jesus had left the vehicle. I, was on, I didn't know it. I was on my own. The brother wasn't even with me. And that little directional cable had it hanging on there, and that just made me even madder. Like, my God in heaven, I can't even. So I grabbed the mirror cable and started whooping the window with that cable and the mirror till I disintegrated the mirror. Now, don't, don't have a lot of disrespect for me. That was last week, and I prayed through since then. <laughs> Not really. That was like 28 years ago or something. <laughs> if my mama's watching, I'll have to explain all that later. <laughs> but there are still things I don't do intimidation well. I don't like it when I'm in Walmart in the checkout line. Are y'all okay? It's only 11 o'clock. Uh, if you got to go out, just mill about. Come on. I don't like being in the checkout line at the great Walmart. And somebody comes up on me, won't try to intimidate me and get in front of me in the little checkout line. <sighs> and my wife is like, you're, you're going to get in a mess one day. I suppose there's going to be two of us in. That's all I can tell you. You're going to get beat up one day. It's possible. <laughs> but it's going to cost them. I can tell you that right now. Both of us are going to need first aid assistance. And when I think people are trying to... <sighs> when people just want to get up in your business and... There is literally, I, I, my body just breaks out in a heat. And I feel that maybe it's just something we men have. I don't know. I've been around some men that didn't have it, and I, I had enough for both of us. But <laughs> if I was a vehicle, there's no reverse in it. And, and if you start with me, we're just going to have to go to the end of it, or you're going to have to back off because there's something in me that just cannot let it go. Whew. And then, the, do I feel a witness? Anybody in here know what the brother's talking about? Thanks be to God. Y'all all out there looking sanctified. Don't nobody want to amen nothing. I'm talking about my strongholds. It's, whoo, and the enemy is trying to rebuild that thing all the time. And so, from time to time, things will happen that will cause me to realize, hey, wait a minute, I hadn't been as diligent about this as I should have. He got a wall up, and I didn't even know it. Ooh, I got to tear this thing back down. There are strongholds that exist in our lives, whether we acknowledge them or not. They're there. If, if you're a fearful person, I've had, I've, I've had issues where the spirit of fear has come to me sitting on planes. And, and I've never blacked out in my life, but I've been on airplanes, 
And, and all of a sudden, big old black spots hit me, and I, I just nearly lose my sight and feel like I'm going out, just going to pass smooth out, sitting in my plane seat because the devil's telling me, you're going to die. This plane's going to crash. You're never going to see Jennifer and Erica and Eliana and Malachi again. It's over. You're dying. And, and all of a sudden, I realize that there's a part of my nature as, as tenacious as I may be about being intimidated, then this mental game that will hit you, and it's like, all the hypotheticals and the worst case scenarios and well if this happens then that happens and the enemy will try to get you to construct a prison for yourself in just a moment's time you don't have do you realize the scripture says that God has not given us a spirit of fear where when did that take place uh, the new birth your original birth we were born with the ability to be afraid but in the new birth God does not give us the rebirth in that water, being filled with the Holy Ghost. He said, you know what? Your natural birth may have given you that, but when you were reborn into the kingdom, I didn't give you the ability to be timid and afraid. It's unnatural for a child of God to live in fear. That's why it's so uncomfortable and there's such a conflict that takes place in your life because it is not natural for us to be afraid. But I'll guarantee you that 90% of everybody in this room, me included, at some point in time has dealt with and wrestled with and been pinned down by a spirit of fear. Worst case scenario, a tornado siren goes off in the south, you're going to have to deal with it for a minute. Because there's a tornado coming and we got to find somewhere to be. A couple of years ago, we, we, were, we did our house we had before had a safe room in it that would withstand an F5 tornado. This house does not. I'm putting an addition on it, and I'm putting a safe room in it, so we'll be fine. But uh, the blood is still powerful. Even when there's no safe room to go get in, the blood will still take care of things. But I've got to believe in that more than I believe in that tornado. And there's a stronghold of fear. And if we're not careful, the enemy will have us locked up in a place of fear, and so a couple of years ago, it was bad weather, and tornadoes were popping everywhere. It was late at night, and my wife and kids are in the short hall there. That There's a door that's a closet under the stairway, and they were in there, and I was standing at the front door, and one of the kids was crying, and I don't remember which one it was, a little upset, may have been Malachi, and my wife's got her phone out watching the weather reports and all of it. And the sirens are going off all over our town. And we were in the thick of it. And something, I, I, it wasn't a heroic thing, but something just came all over me. Either, either I'm going to be a prisoner of a spirit of fear or I'm not going to be one. And to not be one, I've got to do the opposite of what I would do if I'm going to serve fear in this very moment. I didn't know what else to do. I just opened the front door, and that wind was blowing out of the west almost straight line. And the rain's coming in the front door. We had to clean the foyer up when I got through. But I stood there, and I, all I could think of was, no, in Jesus' name, you will not. In Jesus, And I just started saying it. In Jesus' name, you will not. The lightning flashed, and there that thing was on the backside of my neighbor's house across the street. <clears throat> And all I could think of was, in Jesus' name, you will not. The lightning flashed again. It was gone. It came up, went over our house, sucked the trampoline up in the backyard, flipped it upside down, sucked all the floaties out of the swimming pool, the pool house, the porch, everything was pulled off of it. It tore up all kind of stuff. But it went over my house and did everything it could to get to us. But there was something about the name. In Jesus, you and I have got to decide which stronghold we're going to be a part of. I'm either going to be a stronghold of the name or I'm going to submit to the stronghold of fear. God has given us weapons. And though I may still have a tendency to be angry after I've received the Holy Ghost, I don't have to submit to it now. I've got the power. You should be endued with power from on high after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I called my mother in the middle of all that storm. I said, Mom, she lives six miles from us. There was another tornado tracking right to her neighborhood. I said, Mom, are you okay? Yes. Do you need me to come get you? No, son, I'm fine. The Lord's got me. When the storm lifted, it took me two hours to get to her at about 1.15 in the morning. And when I pulled into her neighborhood, there were trees everywhere, limbs everywhere, all kind of cars 
carnage all on every street in her neighborhood except in her yard. There wasn't a leaf in the yard. There wasn't a twig off a tree. There was nothing wrong at Mama's house. Why? Because she made the same decision I did. We're just going to live in the stronghold of the name and we're going to let God take care of it all. But the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. But they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. The weapons that God has given us are designed to tear down strongholds. And every stronghold is not some demonic fortress out here in the community that's included. But some of those strongholds in our life are, are muscle memory. <clears throat> I knew a man that had been trying to receive the Holy Ghost for 35 plus years. And he had a stronghold in his life he couldn't get past. And so because of it, he, he never was able to receive the Holy Ghost. You don't get the Holy Ghost, you receive it. And there are things that we got to let go of to be able to have the capacity to receive the Holy Ghost. So <clears throat> one of the things he couldn't let go of was a spirit of hopelessness. He had smoked for so long, uh, most of his life since he was like, I don't know, 13, 14 years old. And he did not have any hope that he could be free of cigarettes. As a result of that, he couldn't receive the Holy Ghost. He didn't have to give them up. He could have had a cigarette five minutes before we started that Bible study. And God would have still filled him with the Holy Ghost. And then he would have left them behind. But he couldn't receive the Holy Ghost because he didn't think he deserved it and that he could or that he could live without cigarettes once he received the Holy Ghost. So I began to talk to him about the cross and Calvary. And I told him, I said, just close your eyes. And listen to what I'm going to tell you. I want you to be there when they nail him on that cross. I went through the whole deal. Tears began to run down his face. And he said, in the midst of all of this, he said, why did you do that? Talking like to Jesus on the cross. He, just, he was so caught up in it. And I said, he did it for you. And when I told him that, tears just and the sobs just came out of him. I got him up, walked him over to the prayer room where the saints of God were already praying. It's about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I'd called some of them to come pray. Walked him into that prayer room, and when his foot stepped across the threshold, all of that left him, and before his second foot hit the carpet, he was speaking in tongues. He laid on that floor and talked in tongues for two hours. Now, in that moment, his desire and craving for a cigarette was gone instantly. You could taste the nicotine in the air of that prayer room when it left him. <clears throat> the next morning, that afternoon, he had thrown all that stuff away, cigarettes, cigars, all of it. He had chunked it. The next morning, alarm goes off. He owned a roofing company. He and his sons, they were roofers extraordinaire. And he got up before daylight, and they were on the roof early. The next morning, his alarm goes off. He rolls over, hits the alarm, and reached for that pack of cigarettes. Because every morning for over 35 years, he had turned the alarm off, grabbed his cigarettes, shook one out, put it between his lips, got his little lighter, lit it, got up, went to the restroom, and went to the kitchen for coffee. That morning, guess what he did? Same thing. But there was no cigarettes because God had delivered him from it. He, he had no, no desire for it. And when he thought about them, he'd get sick at his stomach. But that morning when he woke up, he rolled over and hit the alarm and reached for the cigarettes. And immediately the enemy jumped right up in the middle of his brain and started telling him, see there, you really didn't get what you thought you got. And you're really not delivered. Because if you were delivered, you wouldn't want a cigarette. Well, he called me. He was a wretched mess. And I said, um, do you know why basketball players stand in one spot? for an hour or two at a time and just shoot repetitiously. Somebody's throwing them balls and they're just shooting jump shots, free throws, whatever it is. Not to just get good at their aim and the trajectory and the arch of the ball, not just that, but they're training their muscles because your muscles have memories. It's called muscle memory. Football players, baseball players, basketball players, tennis players, a lot of what they do is skill, but there's also a significant amount of what they do that's muscle memory. And, and they don't have to make a cognitive decision about how they're going to respond to a play. 
their muscles have been trained to the point they know what to do, how to catch it, where to jump, where to be at the right time. And I said, our muscles have muscle memories. And you have trained your body for 35 plus years to reach for a cigarette. Now, the pulling down of a stronghold is you now have the Holy Ghost. You get to reject shame. Shame and condemnation and guilt will put you back in a cigarette prison. God delivered you from cigarettes yesterday, but you are going to have to take that same power and tear down this stronghold for the next 7 to 30 days maybe. I don't know how long it'll take. But if you'll break the habit, he'll break the bonds. If you'll break loose of the things that he's given you freedom from, but you got to do it here, you'll never serve that again. When, when we, in his case, you reach for a pack, if you accept the lie that's immediately there for you to accept, you reach for a pack of cigarettes that are not there, that you don't want, but your body, your muscle memory says reach for it. You respond in anger when somebody does something to you and you feel your temper hit and that flush of blood flow hits your brain and you're ready to just drive your fist down someone's throat, but you don't do it. The enemy doesn't allow you to champion the fact that, and, and rejoice in the fact that you didn't do it. All he wants to do is try to make you feel guilty about the fact that you, you had that emotion. You, you well, he rem the scripture says he remembereth our frame that it is but dust. We forget that about ourselves. And so just because the impulse is there to do what I've always done is not something that you should feel guilty about. That impulse is there, and there'll come a day when you have destroyed that stronghold so completely that the enemy will have to find something else to mess with you about. Right. <clears throat> but our job, once he's made us free, our job is to stay free. And our job is to take the Word and the Spirit and tear down strongholds. And if you are a suspicious type person, and let's say that somebody cheated on you in a past relationship. If they've cheated on you, then... There's a part of you that will be suspicious for a long, long time. Maybe forever if you don't get it dealt with. They cheated on me. Okay, fine. They cheated. So now you've got to resist the urge to accuse them of cheating every time they're five minutes late getting home from work. Yeah, but what if they did? Okay, but what if they didn't? Who's in prison here? You berating them and, and beating on them all the time, they're not in prison. You are. Because you can't live free of the fact. You can't live free and accept the fact traffic may have been bad. There may have been a long red light somewhere. They may have got held up at the gas station. We, we, don't, we don't even consider any of that. All we can see is what they probably did that correlates with what they have done in the past and they still don't love me and they still don't care about me and they're still cheating on me and I'm the only fool in the house and I'm the one that's being made a mockery out of. And they didn't do anything. They actually went by and picked you up a gift on the way home that they had ordered and it was delivered to them and they're at the store waiting and they had to go by and pick it up. And you all worked up and nodded up about something that didn't even happen. I knew a couple that he worked for uh, a utility company and he was out at going reading meters all the time, every day. That was his job. His wife, uh, nobody realized that she was mentally starting to uh, get a little vulnerable and she got to watching the daytime soap operas and somebody on there was cheating on their spouse and she didn't know that this was all done on a stage somewhere she thought this was cameras following people in their real life and she got to the point she was convinced that her husband was cheating on her every day not not doing just his job but he was out here cavorting around at all these houses and she made him stand at the front door while she sniffed his clothes to see if she could smell perfume. Checked his neck to see if he had a little, little kissy mark on his neck somewhere. She, and then as he got, he was ancient of days and she got to locking him in his bedroom. He was crippled up to the fact he couldn't walk anymore and she had him where she wanted him. And she, he 900 years old and she still got him hemmed up in a guest bedroom because she's afraid he was going somewhere or somebody coming after him. Who was really in the prison? She drove herself nuttier than a holiday fruitcake. 
She was the one. He had never, he was one of the most pure hearted, spiritual, Christian people you'd ever want to meet. But she believed something. She bought into it. And the problem with thoughts and memories, you can tell when a memory and an event is still not healed because that memory still has an emotion attached to it. When our memories still bring us pain, they're not healed. And we've got to keep putting them on the altar, leaving them there, going through the whole process. But the sad thing is we, we now have churches across the world that are full of people who are imprisoned by fear, by shame, by the past, by anxiety about the future, a lack of trust in God, just, just a litany of things that we can imagine. Our responsibility is to tear down strongholds in our own life and the way we do it is we immediately recognize this is a stronghold lord you've got to help me right now give me the grace and the strength to do the opposite of what this thing's trying to get me to do yeah but brother shelton i've been cheated on a hundred times well knock him out you probably feel better I knew a woman, knew of a woman down in Mississippi. Her husband would come home and he'd be drunk. He'd work offshore. He'd come in. And uh, she had had all that she could take. And she wasn't going to be a servant to it anymore. One evening he come in offshore, went to the bar and drank till the next day. I think that's the way it was. And um, I know the man that was their pastor at the time. And he gets a phone call from this woman, and her husband had come in. He'd done whooped her a little bit, and he went in there and passed out on the bed, right on top of the cover, just moved out. So she cleaned her blood up and bandaged herself up, and she got some needle and thread, and she went in there and just took those covers and folded them over him and sewed the brother right up in it. <laughs> then she went and got about an eight-inch cast iron, cornbread skillet and beat the soup out of him. That's why the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. <laughs> some of you need, to, some of us need to just beat the soup out of the devil. Just lay the thunder to him. I'm not serving this anymore. I'm not going to be a prisoner to this anymore. She called the pastor. She said, I'm pretty sure I've killed him. I'm going to need some help over here. He got over there. I think they called the police. They certainly called the paramedics. He never drank another drop of nothing. He'd just break out in a sweat if somebody even opened a can of beer in front of him. And he never raised his hand above his waist around her. He kept them in his pocket. He didn't want her to even think he was about to hit her again. Well, you, you can break the devil, too. You can break your mind from doing those things to you, too. There are things that God has delivered us from, but we've got to stay free of it. We have got to tear down the strongholds. Our reaction to circumstances and events is where we find ourselves once again in another stronghold. Whoever's playing the piano, would you do that melodiously, whoever it is? And give the people of God a false sense of hope. But don't stampede to the platform by any stretch. <clears throat> it's hard to hear stuff like this talked about sometimes because it means I've got to get honest with myself about what I'm dealing with. And there are some of you that are in this room. The enemy has lied to you. I had a preacher call me one night and he said he was sobbing. I was driving down the interstate, and the enemy had convinced him that he had certain proclivities in his life. And I said, well, is it true? He said, no, sir, it's not. I said, then why are you so torn up about it? He said, but what if it's there and I don't realize it? I'm like, my God, you're, you're in your mid-40s. I'm pretty sure if all this stuff was there, you'd have found out by now. 
I said, uh, are those proclivities there? No, sir. Then why are you believing it? I don't know, but what if? And then it hit me. This is a man who lives in a continual state of fear. Just, if I told you stories about him, they're endearing, they're funny, they're whatever. But it's there because he's fearful. And he was afraid not to take the accusation seriously. Because what if there's some element of truth to it? And there's people in this room who got the same struggle. You live with timidity in your life. But what if? And there's verses of Scripture like, There's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For by the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, I have been made free from the laws of sin and death. We're not servants of sin anymore. We're not servants of sin anymore. We're not servants of sin anymore. Not just am I not a servant of sin, I'm not a servant of the memory of the sins I've committed. And I think that's where a lot of the confliction is sometimes with us. We're, we're just, we're a servant of the memory of what I've done. Even though I know God forgave me. So why do I still feel guilty? Why do I still feel ashamed of it? Why do I still speak death over my future? If God really has forgiven me. Because you live in a stronghold. You've got a stronghold of doubt and unbelief. Why do we live waiting on the other shoe to drop? You hear somebody taking their shoes off in another room, especially hardwood floors or something, and they drop a work boot. Instinctively, you immediately start waiting on the other shoe to come off and hit the floor. And we do that in the kingdom. We're glad to be in the house of God. We're glad to be in the bride of Christ. But we, and we want to be involved, Bishop, to a certain point. But then the enemy says, if you go any further in being involved, somebody's going to find out what you did. Somebody's going to find out about the life you came from. Those two ladies that I told you that had been prostitutes at one point, their greatest asset was their testimony. Everybody in their neighborhood knew them. They didn't leave their neighborhood when they got saved. They lived in the same neighborhood where they bought and sold crack and prostituted themselves so they could feed their kids and buy and sell crack. And when God changed them, they stayed right where they were. And service after service, they, they would have so many people on that 65 passenger bus, there'd be 80 people on it. They'd be in the floor, sitting down the aisle, sitting on the steps. God forbid they'd ever got pulled over. What matters is who's telling your story. You going to let the devil tell it and put his slant on it forever? They were made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their own testimony. The very thing that hell wants to wrap you up in and chain you down forever with is the very thing that God wants to use to not only help you be free, stay free, but to help make somebody else free too. Again, the scripture says, He that the Son hath made free is free indeed. Free indeed. There is therefore no condemnation. None. For those that are in Christ. If you've got the Holy Ghost this morning, you're in Christ. There's no condemnation. You never again have to tell anybody, Hey, I messed up, you know. No, now your testimony is God is good. How do you know that? Because I remember the hole he dug me out of. I don't mind my story being told, Brother Williams, but I'm going to tell it right. Yeah. Well, there's angels moving in here. I can feel them. It's my story. I'll tell it. I'm not going to tell it with a lie on it either. 
I was wretched. <laughs> I was a mess. You hear me? I was a messed up fella at times in my life. But I have not been saved so long that I can't remember the mighty hand of God reaching down in that nasty pit. Not once, not twice, but every time I've called out to him. And though I'm not living those deeds over and over and over in my life, my brain wants to take me down that road again and get me to relive it. And you know what I do when the enemy starts that mess with me? I just call out to him again. And the same hand that reached into that pit originally reaches down and keeps me from going back into it again. Over and over and over. I think I told Bishop this the other day, but I am of the conviction that the greatest, most prevalent spirit of our day in the church and out of the church is hopelessness. Not addiction. Addiction is a result of being hopeless. A person doesn't get addicted to drugs if they have no hope, unless they have no hope that they'll be happy, that they've got a future, that things are going to work out. People, people find themselves in a mess. Oh, well, they were just experimenting. They were experimenting because they were looking for something that would give them hope. We've got saints of God that have been filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name, doing everything we know to do that's right before God. And yet the enemy's still living right there behind you. Hey, don't forget your past. And yet the writer said, surely... Goodness and mercy have got that covered too. I got a future because Jesus is there. And goodness and mercy are keeping yesterday from getting a hold of me again. The only thing that's going to cause me to identify with the past is what's in my head. Strongholds, strongholds. Have we got regrets? Yes. If the water's under the bridge, baby, you can't get it back. It's gone. You don't unspill the milk, but you don't identify with it either. Yeah, I spilled the milk one time, but I don't have any on me now. Yeah, I messed up one time. I messed up a hundred times. I messed up today. But the blood, I'll tell my story, but I'm not going to let the enemy tell it for me. I'll tell it. I was wretched. I was a hot mess till Jesus got a hold of me. But when he found me, he made me a new creature in him. Old things passed away and everything, that's what the book says. Behold, all things have passed away. Every old thing's gone. It's over. It's passed. It's under the blood. Bury it. That's what baptism is. Baptism is not just the washing away of sins. It's also the burying of it. And when God buries it, it doesn't get dug back up. When God buries it, you don't ever have to answer for that again. It's over. Fear, unbelief, doubt, worry. How do you tear down the stronghold of worry? Stop saying things like, I'm worried about this or I'm worried about that. Fearfulness, timidity. How do you tear that stronghold down? Stop saying things like, well, I'm just, you know, I don't know what, I don't know what we're going to do about this. We've got, yes, we do. We do know what we're going to do about it. I don't know how he's going to fix it, but I know what I'm going to do with it. I'm going to take it to him. I'm going to give it to Jesus. I don't have to have the answers. I know the answer. He's the answer. And this is all his issue to deal with. I'm not letting fear and timidity have a place in my mind ever again. Everybody stand with me. Everybody has strongholds. There are people that are in the kingdom of God that the enemy has told them, perhaps even in this room on today, you will never be happy again. You did this in your past. You were mean. You were abusive. You were violent. You were a cusser. You were... But the blood says, I don't remember that. Here's how powerful the blood is. When Paul was compelled by God to write to the church at Rome about Abraham... Paul's words and recollection of Abraham on God's behalf was, he never staggered at my promises. 
in light of the Arab nations in existence because of Ishmael, who is proof that there was at least a bobble. Somewhere that must have been put under the blood. Because when the Lord looks back over time, he tells Paul, write this about Abraham. As far as I know, that brother never staggered at the promises that I made him. The blood's powerful. I know a guy that's been in jail for over a year, almost a year and a half. Dead two rights. Probation violation, drugs in the vehicle, gun in the vehicle. Convicted felon many times over. About three months ago, goes to court. His sister is a praying woman. God, if there's any chance he can be saved out of jail better than he can in jail, I'm asking you one more time, intervene. He goes in, meets with his lawyer. His lawyer looks at him across the table and says, I don't really know how to explain this to you, but they have dropped every charge. Not accusations, charges. They had the proof. It was in the pudding. They had the pudding in the bowl and the bowl on the judge's desk. He was going to jail for 30 years. That's how powerful the blood is. Now he's raising his kid, being the dad he should have been a long time ago. That's how powerful the blood is. I don't care if you've got to sign an employee agreement or disclosure or you're filling out a job application and you've got to acknowledge, yes, I've been incarcerated before. I'm, I wish that our society didn't require that, really. But just because you may have to write that on a piece of paper, you don't have to let that be your identity in the kingdom. I was in California one time, and a man walked up to me, and he said, I need to tell you something. He was a hard-looking dude, man. I mean, he, he said, uh, I did 20 years in San Quentin. And he said, I'm not even going to bore you with all the details of it but he said the worst crimes you could think of I did them he said probably some things you can't imagine I've done them he was tatted up from his fingernails to the top of his head scars from fights gunshots knife wounds whatever and I looked at him before he could even finish telling it all I said hush I don't look at you and see that. Didn't even feel that. Yeah, but I know God shows you stuff. Not things that are under the blood. It's invis I don't care how gifted some preacher may be. If they're a prophet and a seer, it don't matter. If it's under the blood, God's not going to let him see it. Here's the thing. That was that man's road. He had been down that road, Bishop. He really had. But when service was going on, he didn't look like a man that had been in San Quentin. Tears are running down his face. He's walking through the church, praying with people in the altar, praying with kids, praying them through to the Holy Ghost, teaching Bible studies. All the evidence was still on his body. Wounds, scars, violence, crime. But he chose not to let that be the stronghold he lived in. If you want to be free, and I mean really free, of this stuff right here, there might not be but one person. I bet you there's more. You're, you're tired of that stronghold being prevalent in your life, and you're ready for the grace of God to empower you, to rise above it, to tear it down, to no longer serve that identity, and you want to be free. Come around this front. you got about seven seconds to get moving. <clears throat> Find yourself a place to praise. Men of God, ladies of God, the ministry is going to come among you and start praying for you. If you want to kneel, you can. You want to stand, you can. But no guilt, no shame, no condemnation. Just today, I'm going to be free of it. The rest of you, begin to stretch your hand toward these that are in this altar praying this morning. No more condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For by the law of the Spirit of life, I am made free. 
Come on, repent. Just go ahead and start out with a good, solid spirit of repentance. Lord, I am so sorry that I have allowed these thoughts to inundate my mind, to make me a prisoner of them over and over again because the blood really was complete at Calvary. Come on, you talk to him. They may play and sing, but this is about you and him and you being free. You being free to the point that you're no longer a prisoner of these strongholds. Come on. That's it. Come on, let it go. You let it go. Some of you need to forgive yourself this morning. You need to acknowledge it in your own mind. I've done some things I regret, and I wish I'd never done them, but God is faithful. He's faithful. I repented a long time ago, and he forgave me a long time ago. And I'm not going to take ownership of it again. I'm not going to let it be my identity again. I'm not going to let what somebody did to me be my identity. I'm not going to let fear imprison me. Come on. That's it. Shake it off.